Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So when designing an API, it's easy to think about the happy path of your application. But if you want to build a robust application and keep your users happy, then you need to consider the unhappy path as well. What happens if your user's internet connection cuts out just after making a request? Or maybe your server's struggling under load and the client times out before it can receive a response. Usually errors are handled by the client by doing retries. If there's an error or the request times out, then the client will retry a number of times, either automatically or by a frustrated user hitting that submit button. If the user sends multiple requests to the server and more than one of them gets through, then you'll likely end up with duplicates on your end. Depending on the application, this might not be a big deal. If the user is just writing a comment on a blog post or reviewing a product, then it's not the end of the world if they end up with multiple posts. But what if they're sending an email? Is it okay for the recipients to receive multiple copies of the same email? What if they were buying something online? Would the customer be happy if they got charged twice or maybe even 10 times for the same product? This is where idempotency comes in. But what does it actually mean? If we have a look at the internet standards, it says the following. A request method is considered idempotent if the intended effect on the server of multiple identical requests with that method is the same as the effect for a single such request. So if we call an API multiple times with the same request, then it's considered idempotent if it has the same effect on the server as if we'd only called it once. Now let's have a look at the most common methods and see whether they're idempotent or not. The get method is read-only. It doesn't affect the server in any way. Nothing gets created or updated, so we can call the get method multiple times without it having any adverse effects. So a get method is always idempotent. With a put request, we're going to be performing updates. So let's say we're updating a user's email address. No matter how many times we call this method, we should always get the same response, and the user's details are always going to get updated to the same thing. So a put request is always idempotent as well. With a post request, we're creating something on the server. So if we call this method multiple times, then we should expect to get multiple copies of the same thing. Or in some cases, we might get an error if we're trying to create something that can only be one of. For example, if we're trying to create a new user with a post request, then the first request will go through, but a second request for the same username will fail because the user already exists. Technically, this is still idempotent, but it's not a very nice experience for the user. Let's say when they make their first request, they then have an internet connection failure and therefore don't get the response. When they try and retry, it will tell them that the username already exists, but in fact, it was their first request that created that user. If we take the example of making a payment, then generally there aren't any unique identifiers on a payment like there are with creating a user. This is what we typically might send through on a platform like Stripe if someone's buying something for $20. However, there is nothing unique about this request that links it to a particular purchase. If a payment platform receives two of these, then it'll just think it's two separate payments and charge the customer twice, which is not what we want. So post requests are generally not idempotent. With patch requests, it depends on how you use them. If you're just using it to update an email address of a user, then that could be considered idempotent. However, you can also use a patch request to do things like copy, move, add, and remove, and therefore it's not considered idempotent. Finally, we have the delete method, which deletes an object on the server. If you run delete multiple times, it's gonna have the same effect on the server as if you'd only run it once. Sure, the second time you might run it, you might get an error, but the actual server doesn't change its state. Therefore, delete is also considered to be idempotent. In the cases where you're making a payment or some other critical operation that needs to happen exactly once, then you need to make those other methods such as post and patch idempotent as well. The only way that you can really do this is to have some form of unique identifier. That way you can distinguish that request from some otherwise identical requests. You may have something like this already in place. Let's go back to the payment analogy. Let's say you have a saved basket of items and that basket has an ID. That ID is therefore unique to that order and you could use that ID for the item potency key. Another option is to hash the body of the request. However, if you're doing this, you need to make sure that there's no reason for that person to ever send exactly the same request. There should be something about the combination of fields in the request that makes it unique. For example, if someone orders a SpongeBob beach towel and then 30 seconds later orders another SpongeBob beach towel, you don't know that that's a duplicate order. They might just really like SpongeBob. Generally, the way this is normally done is to add an item potency key to a header. Stripe, for example, have a header called item potency dash key, but really this could be anything. So you now have some form of key that makes this request unique. However, with a user supplied key, you can't guarantee that it's going to be globally unique. The user could send you the same key as another user or even the same key from multiple endpoints. 
So it's important you always combine that user supplied key with something like a user ID as well as the API path that's being used. To implement item potency, you need to store your combined item potency key along with the successful response that you send to the user. If a request with the same item potency key comes in, instead of actually performing the operation, you just send them back a response that you sent out before. As far as the user is concerned, the operation was successful and they don't need to know that you're sending out a previous response. Typically, this is done using some form of key value storage such as Redis or DynamoDB. Technically, you could store your item potency keys in an in-memory storage such as a dictionary. However, this won't work if you have multiple copies of your API running behind the load balancer as each API won't be able to see the keys in the other copies. You will also lose your item potency keys whenever you have to restart your application. So this is why we don't store them in memory. So when a request comes in, you need to first check to see whether that item potency key that's been sent is in your storage. And if it is, then you just send back the response that you have stored. If the item potency key doesn't exist, then you carry on with a normal operation. And if it's successful, then you store the item potency key along with the response before sending it back to the user. How long you store your item potency keys for really depends on the application. If you have item potency enabled just to protect yourself from a user clicking on something multiple times, then you might only need to store them for say 10 minutes. But if you have some sort of retry mechanism in place, then you might need to store them for longer. Typically, we store item potency keys for anywhere between 24 and 48 hours, but you need to check with your application and see if it makes sense to store them for longer. If you are using something like Redis or DynamoDB to store your keys, then you can use the time to live or TTL so that your keys are automatically deleted for you. You may also want to consider item potency validation in your API. If a request comes in with the same item potency key from the same user for the same endpoint, then we're just going to assume that that's the same request and send them out the same response. However, there is a chance that the user has just used the same item potency key by mistake and the request body is actually very different. If you need to protect yourself against this sort of scenario, then you can take a hash of the request and store that alongside the item potency key. And then when the request comes in, you can check to see whether it matches the hash as well. And if it doesn't, it'll return an error to the user. If you want to implement this in a .NET Core API, then you can make use of the distributed caching library and then store your keys in Redis. And then you can create a filter, which you can then add to each of the endpoints where you want item potency. To make this even easier, there is a NuGet package called Idempotent API that does all the heavy lifting for you. If you want to support this channel and also get access to the code shown in my videos, then you can subscribe on Patreon. Patreon members also get access to exclusive content from me, as well as a private Discord community and generous discounts to my courses once I release them. Thank you for watching this video and I'll hopefully see you in the next one.